Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today I'm pleased to welcome back Afa Michael Weaver, whose first appearance on this show remains a viewer favorite. Afa's words resonated in part because his wonderful poetry is matched by his fascinating life journey and his strength of character. As you may recall, Afa grew up in inner city Baltimore, where limited opportunities, violence, and prison were the norm for many young African American men. Afa worked in a factory for many years until poetry changed his life path and his sense of purpose. Since then, Afa has published 11 books of poetry. He was named a Pew Fellow in Poetry, and he was the first African-American poet to hold the poet in residence position at the Stadler Poetry Center at Bucknell University. Afa is the alumni professor of English at Simmons College in Boston, where he has taught for many years and studied Mandarin and Taoist meditation. Afa is with us now to talk about his new collection, The Government of Nature, which he describes as deeply personal and difficult to write. Every poem represents a step along a lifelong spiritual journey that has been both painful and freeing. I'm honored to have Afa here again. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back, Elizabeth. You have a poem for us. I do. Um, the poem is entitled Elegy for the Appaloosa's Mother mm -hmm. and is a response to a poem from an earlier book of mine. Mm -hmm. The poem is, uh, the epigraph is, To My Uncle the Cowboy. The Blood Bay Mare, deep red black with yellow, her mane and waves after we braided it, white blaze frosting her nose, and I took too long to comb her patting her up under her belly the way a 14-year-old boy would do. And you snatched the brush away before I could get to cool her down with water. Snatched her from my hands to your hands, from the soft wonder to a rough smack of a backhand as a threat, a backhand that beat a stallion until the white of its eyes came untied from the bone back of an eyeball soft gel. And fear hit me the way Tears light up like flames afraid to let themselves go when a child is made to know what animals must know, the beating down, blood and meat where spirit and song should be. You bred this mare named after dreaming of names, bred her to the neighbor's proud Appaloosa stallion, some blood bay on his front, a big blanket behind, white spread over his rump of dark dots like eyes bred her and brought her back to say the foal was mine. Mine, for odd reasons, you would not name. We, walking into the farmhouse, through the back door to the kitchen, telling me you were going to leave me a million dollars, a million dollars of insurance when you were gone to the coffin, when all I can do is stroke the thin fibers of your good hair and the stone leather the skin comes to be. Hardness the hollow wood of death, or the way things are beaten down, down, until the hands of hurt force a child to nurse on terror. Mm. Every time I read that poem, I'm struck by three things. The first is the gentleness with which you took care of that horse. And the second is the violence of your uncle's behavior. And the third is just your connection to that animal, that wonderful, strong, and yet fragile animal. What's the first thing that comes to mind for you when you read that poem? Well, it was, she was the mother of the Appaloosa foal that was given to me. And um, when she was carrying the foal, whom I later named Neza, I would go out and I watched the foal growing inside of her. And, and um, I, I had this sense of awe as a child. And I wanted to watch the, the foal being born, but I was in Baltimore in my parents' house when, when she was delivered. And when I did see her, she was standing, standing up on her spindly legs. And, and uh, she was born in, in um, a smaller barn that was actually an old garage. 
And uh, so when I, when I saw her immediately, knew that I would name her Nez. I had gone to the library and researched Appaloosas and the Nez Perce Indians. And so um, there was that sense of wonder. Um, at the time, um, I was uh, disappointed to have the breast snatched away from me because I wanted to take time and comb her. Um, and in retrospect, I came to understand just how violent some of those gestures were with her and some of the other animals that were involved in life on the farm. Mm. Yeah. And your uncle, in particular, violence seemed to define much of his behavior, and it had a terrible impact on you. It did. Um, there's, there's the violence of, of, of being disturbed and molested as a child, and, you know, we, children repress those things when we were as young as I was, and mm -hmm. until they begin to manifest as we get older. And um, I had been in, in treatment and uh, uh, in therapy for a few years for issues which I did not know the root of, uh, when the memory of, of this you know, abusive quality of my childhood emerged. Um, and it was, um, the door was opened by a book of mine that was published in 1998, a book by the name of Talisman, uh, where I talk about my mother and uh, my three marriages and one relationship with a girlfriend. But um, that, that book opened the door to my abusive childhood. I gave a reading from that book um, at Bucknell, and um, someone who heard me read um, made the comment that um, she said, that, that man was abused. And that comment was relayed to me. And at the time, it didn't exactly register, but and now when I read that book, especially the, the sections about loss and so on, it's a painful book to read. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it just came out, and I wrote it in the summer of 1994. Mm -hmm. It was published in 1998. And so suddenly, bits and pieces of my life began to come together and I came to understand the difficulties that I've had, the horrible relationship history, um, health problems. Um, these things began to, to make sense and sometimes it was a very painful clarity. I didn't want them to make sense. I didn't want to accept that. What's interesting to me about the new book is that you are writing about this terrible trauma. And yet in so many poems, what's obvious is that it's, it's not just a physical abuse, but it's a spiritual abuse as well. It is. It's, um, it, it, it's the child's um, spiritual well-being is endangered. In the space of, the, of the, the trauma itself, in the space of being disturbed, children are given um, the message that danger is, is ordinary or that danger should be expected. And so people who have been victimized that way can um, find themselves in high-risk behaviors or looking for the worst kind of relationship or thinking that abuse is love. Mm -hmm. or not being able to claim your own success mm -hmm. um, in life, being a perfectionist and a workaholic on one hand, mm -hmm. but not actually being able to claim your own success. And I was thinking today about a moment in Taiwan a few years ago. I was there in the summer studying Mandarin. Mm -hmm. I've gone back and forth to Taiwan and China for 10 years now. And I went to a dinner for Derek Walcott that was arranged by a friend, uh, Michelle Ye. And so the arrangement was for me to be with Derek Walcott. And when I walked into the room, the chair was sitting next to him reserved for me. Mm -hmm. And I just did not believe that was my chair. I oh. sit on the other end of the table. And now it seems embarrassing and perhaps a bit humorous, mm -hmm. but I just could not accept that that was me mm -hmm. being asked to sit there and keep company with Derek Walcott. And so, mm -hmm. and I've had situations like that happen to me more than, uh, more than I care to uh, recount. Mm. It's a little embarrassing, but it's that idea that um, you should work for something. Um, you should work for critical acclaim. Mm -hmm. But 
being able to step into the space of that is something mm -hmm. that the child is given um, mm -hmm. the message that is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so you have to work for um, a balance in, inside yourself mm -hmm. and work for a more genuine relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting to me to hear you say that you didn't think you deserved that seat because from my perspective, you do. And I think I have some evidence <laughs> of how well respected you are. Tell us a little bit about this article. Uh, well, three years ago, about three years ago, Rafael Otto came to me after I taught um, a workshop in Arizona and asked if he could interview me. And I said, well, sure, Raphael. And so he, 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 we talked, he recorded it, he transcribed it. And then he said, well, I think I'll send it to the Writer's Chronicle. I said, well, be my guest, good luck. And they took <laughs> it and um, they held on to it for two years. Mm -hmm. And then this past October, they decided that um, they would publish it in their February issue. So it's in the, the new issue. Mm -hmm. with a photo by Catherine Lane, I mm -hmm. might add. You know. Yes, and it's a gorgeous photo, so I want people yeah. to see this. Well, it's, it's an honor. It is an honor. And it comes at the time of the conference in Boston, so, mm -hmm. you know, it, it'll give some people some things to talk about, I think. Mm -hmm. I love this photo because you look very much at peace. You look happy. And there's a slight hint that, hmm, you have a secret. And maybe the secret is that you have found some sense of peace over the years. I like to think so, Elizabeth. And, um, and a good deal of that has come from, um, from um, doing Taoist sitting meditation for uh, 11 years now. Mm -hmm. So, and on a daily basis, and coming to um, understand, and in, in that space of meditation where you're you're interfacing with your your most intimate parts, and mm -hmm. and you begin to you know have some sense of an interface with what we call God and mm -hmm. um, our divine origin. You know, I'm I'm a person who believes in that, and uh, for me. The um, Taoist meditation gives me absolute evidence of that. Mm -hmm. And um, the experience of the meditation also, for me, reaffirms and clarifies the basic um, Christian teachings that I was given as a child. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, for me, it's a blending. Mm -hmm. and, um, and being able to make peace with those things mm -hmm. and have um, a very um, clear idea of my own faith Mm -hmm. as, a, as, as a wedding of two different parts of the world. Mm. And so that is the, the, the center of my serenity, I think. Um, and the kind of pain that I've had in my life, the emotional pain, even physical pain, um, you know, I've, I've had to um, struggle with PTSD for most of my adult life. Mm -hmm. And at one point I was being treated for depression with a drug that caused congestive heart failure. Uh. And so um, when, I, when I look back at the project of forgiveness and what it is that we have to forgive as, as grown up survivors of abusive childhoods, sometimes it seems as if it's too much to forgive. Uh. Um, but I think that forgiveness is our only option. Uh -huh. you know? And it's not something that's done one time it's a process. Mm -hmm. And some days I'll get up and I think, I just can't forgive all this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not just the things I've mentioned, but also the dynamics, the, the system uh, effect of being in a family where your history is known mm -hmm. and where you come to be treated a certain way mm -hmm. and having to undo all of that or work against it. Mm -hmm. And so some days I think, well, today I won't forgive or mm -hmm. today I'll forgive halfway. Mm -hmm. But it is a process. Mm -hmm. you know? and How does writing help you with that process? Well, when, when the fact of the, the abusive um, history of my childhood came to me, I stopped writing on my regular schedule mm -hmm. in 1998. And from 1998 
uh, until 2005. I wrote haphazardly, but for about seven years, I was afraid to write because my writing is what revealed my life to me. Mm -hmm. And so I had to renegotiate um, my relationship with my own writing. Mm -hmm. And um, the government of nature actually began when I was in a monastery in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And um, I just was forced into writing. The man who directs the monastery also writes, and every day he'd say, well, Alpha, have you written anything? And I said, no, oh, no. He said, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. And after a while, one day I just, it was, he, he gave me the kickstart. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's where this book began in mm -hmm. 2005. But for a long time, I thought, you know, I was afraid of poetry, mm -hmm. you know. And I think um, I came to understand what Wallace Stevens said. He said, poetry can kill a man. Mm -hmm. You know, um, or kill a person. We'll have to bring some balance in terms of gender to that <laughs> statement that Stevens made, but uh, that poem, paraphrasing it. But poetry is a powerful thing, mm -hmm. um, and if you engage it, or are, if you are engaged to it, you know, I think, you know, poetry is, was what I was meant to do. Mm -hmm. But the challenges that came with that you know, I came to understand as being pretty big. Mm -hmm. And so having to renegotiate my relationship with my writing deepened my understanding of poetry mm -hmm. and gave me a, a, the door to moving on to a new dimension in my work. Mm. So. When you were writing the poems in this book, did you reach a point where it suddenly became easier or where you were more comfortable with this new negotiation you had with the art? Well, I sent a first version of the manuscript to Ed Ochester, and um, he sent it back. He said, you know, Mike, he calls me Mike. He says, I don't think we're quite there. Hmm. And so um, I took that summer to go back into some of the more difficult poems Mm -hmm. and uh, forming bridges and so on. And so some parts of it seemed easy, some parts of it seemed very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the poem Flying was difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's about out-of-body experiences and so mm -hmm. something I you know, never told anyone about until I was in my 40s and in therapy. Mm -hmm. and, and the person who was the therapist said, you know, do you have any idea what that might mean? <laughs> mm. And so that poem was difficult. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. Mm. Would you like to read that poem for us now? I suppose so. And um, this reading is for um, a friend of mine, Brenda Connor Bay, who mm. passed away. This was a favorite poem of hers. She loved mm. this poem. Flying. A hand pulled me open down on the bed down on the bed looking up holding the covers while the soft sole of me like a crab's inedible meat lifted away meat with thick strings that hold together then elongate themselves to keep me tied bound in the body until this lifting the soul's ugly meat becoming wings and i flew above the house the grays behind it in baltimore cemetery with grandma's marker holding our names. The ceiling was the law saying stop until the hand gave me the gift of flying. In my heart, yes, it is the heart. Night became a magnet of my craving to be one thing forming in the womb of my mother where nascent nubs of self take shape. The brain still asleep in its mysteries until the heart awakens thumps itself into beating with a drum song we know and the endless connections of intestines and brain, mind of gut, mind. Sages say we can fly when God falls asleep, his arm hitting the floor we call earth so the touched can dream of home. Mm. When you say those words aloud now, you must hear the echo of that therapist saying, do you know what that poem is about? As you sit here now, what comes to mind? 
Well, it, um, it's dissociation, you know, and um, extreme dissociation. And it's something that the child has to, has to invoke in the, in the actual act of being molested because it's too okay. terrible to actually, you cannot be present for that. And unfortunately, as you get older, it, sometimes it will stay with you and to varying degrees. So that, that sense of leaving one's body of flying is, is the extreme dissociation. Mm -hmm. And I came to understand it in those terms. And um, it, it was a way out, mm -hmm. you know, it's a way out. But then you have to heal that so that when you're offered a seat next to someone, then you know you should be sitting there. Mm -hmm. How did you choose the title of the book? Oh, well, like those lines that from the Tao Te Ching that are the characters on the, uh, on the uh, left side of the book on the, near the, by the photo are an illustration of what I was thinking about, the, uh, the idea that the, the dark is rooted in the light mm -hmm. and the stillness is rooted in restlessness. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Taoism, as my teacher, his name is Wang Chin Liang. Um, as I understand in that, um, in, in sitting meditation, I come to understand the functioning of nature as human nature and the relationship of that to the world of nature. So Taoism is about seeing very clearly how things are connected, how we are in the world, how we exist in the world, and the origin of our minds, our consciousness, our souls. Mm -hmm. And so that is the government, you know. And it is a government of, um, of what is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. One of the things that I really admire about this book is that you do tackle very difficult material, but throughout it there are glimmers of hope and there are moments where you're clearly reaching for something beyond the physical. And you do connect with the creator or however you would describe God. And in doing so, you help the reader do that as well. And as I read the poems, I kept thinking what I always think when I talk with you, which is that despite the things that have happened to you, you have a very clean and pure and beautiful soul. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, um, I, I like to think we all do. Some people might argue that and look at some very horrible people and say that couldn't be. But you know, our, the, the origin of our souls, of all our souls, I believe, is divine. You mm -hmm. know, it's evidence of the divine working in the world. And that gets interpreted in all kinds of ways and all kinds of religions and practices. But I think the basic fact of it is, I believe the basic fact of it is, is that the existence of our souls is, verifies the existence of its origin. Mm -hmm. Which is the Creator or God or Einsoff or, you know, mm. the mother of all that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put. Mm -hmm. We don't have too much time left, but I wonder if you would read a poem for us. It's one of my favorite in the book. It's called Remember. Mm -hmm. Remember for my granddaughter. If I forget to plug the sun, let me know. If I forget to tame the shark's teeth, let me know. If I forget to stop the tsunamis, let me know. If I forget to tie up the bears, let me know. If I forget to chase away the viruses, let me know. If I forget to clean the unclean foods, let me know. If I forget to stop rushing cars, let me know. If I forget to tame the lightning, let me know. If I forget to melt the slippery ice, let me know. If I forget to outlaw nightmares, let me know. If I forget to put perverts away, let me know. 
If I forget that the divine thing moved inside me to write this, the thing that can do all things, let me know. Let me down easy into the earth. Mm. And that's for Mariah, my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful poem. Mm. What would you tell her about her own soul? I would tell her it's beautiful, as are the souls of her sister and brothers. And I have step-grandchildren. I'd say, you all have beautiful souls. Mm -hmm. And they do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So do you. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Aww. I'm Cheryl Peralt, co-producer of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, an HCAM series honoring poetry, story, and song that takes place on the third Saturday each month before a live audience. Guest features share their art followed by an open mic with people who come from near and far. Others come to listen and be part of this warm and welcoming studio and to wake up a bit to arts and to life. You're welcome to join us and to tune in or visit our website for our weekly program. Hope you can join us. HCAM TV showing movies. That's right. Dive and Drive is a new show on HCAM. Join Mike and I as we present some B movies. Movies that have piqued the two Mike's interest. And not to mention, they're also free. We'll give you some interesting tidbits about the cast and crews. And point out some of the reasons these are classic B films. So check out the HCAM TV website at HCAM.TV for movie days and showtimes. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV.